everybody. Um, my name is Denise the Camp. So I want you to call me Denise when you send me emails or anything, okay? Um, this is the third time I've made this video <clears throat> and uh, I decided it, it wasn't working any other way so um, now I'm making it on the iPhone so I I don't know. You could see me, you can hear me. I guess that's good enough. Okay. I put up, if you'll notice, on Canvas, uh, everything is in modules. Okay, so if you look on the left hand column, um, all that stuff is listed there grades and discussions and everything. Look under modules, and that's where you'll see all the important stuff. Hang on. Okay, uh, and under modules, I put up um, lecture. There's a section on lecture notes, and then lecture videos. So I'll upload this, assuming it works, under lecture videos, and then the notes will be under lecture notes. Okay, and I'll title them the same so that you know. I already put up one lecture note. Um, uh, what did I title it? Uh, Renaissance and Humanism Notes. So that's stuff about humanism and which is obviously something that influenced Pico, okay, in the reading on the dignity of man, okay, and that's what this lecture will be on is Pico. And I'm not going to go through all the Renaissance and Humanism stuff. The notes are enough for that, okay. Now, um, so if you're on Canvas, of course you're on Canvas because you're watching this video, uh, watch the video and read, look at the notes at the same time, okay, so that you can follow along. And open your book, the book that we're using, there are two, remember you should have two, right? So this is backwards, okay, but <laughs> you should recognize it. Um, it's the readings in the humanities. Okay, so it's not the main textbook, it's the readings book. So make sure you open that. And the um, piece that we're looking at on the dignity of man begins up on page one. How nice. So, by the way, it's a good idea to um, read these little introductions to the selections in, the, in this readings textbook because... Um, some of the selections aren't accessible, intellectually speaking, to everybody. So the the uh, editors provide a, a little compendium of the pieces, and they're helpful. Okay, I won't make a video for every single thing that we read, um, but I will for the more difficult stuff. But you know, Frankenstein, and you better not read the cliff notes or anything. You better read Frankenstein or I'm going to be very upset with you. Um, read the book. It's actually amazing. I mean, it's it's amazing. How do, Who doesn't like Frankenstein? It's it's incredible. It, it, it's all about humanity and, like, what we're supposed to be, and it's, it's fantastic. So read the book. Do yourself a favor. Um, but I'm not going to make like 20 different lectures on every chapter or something. That's crazy talk. So, you know, I'll make a couple or whatever and that'll be that. Um, so, anyway. By the way, if my dogs, they barked in the last, when I made this video before, they barked. Um, if they bark or something, I'll hush them and I'm sorry. Now. So go then to the beginning of Pico's piece, and it, it starts on page two, and look at my notes. Okay? So, the first thing I say, um, man has no fixed identity. Um, unlike other entities in the universe, man was created with the ability, that is, free will to choose who he wants to be. Now. I think we tend to think of ourselves as, oh, we do tend to think of ourselves as um, limited in our potential. 
I'm a woman. So one age-old thought about women is that I have a pretty limited potential, certainly more limited than a man, right? Um, obviously we know, I should hope that anybody who's watching this would know that that is untrue, okay? Um, a lot of times we see ourselves through the eyes of our culture, their associations with the particular qualities of our bodies, um, either as a woman or as a man. I mean, men seem to be, um, excuse me, men are told very often that they're limited in their abilities to feel emotion. But, other than, you know, wrath, right, that one they can do in spades. When we look at the romantic poets um, in a couple of weeks, all of whom were men, they write the most deep, inspiring poetry about love, about God, about nature, about themselves, about despair. They are the most feeling creatures I have ever seen in my life. And they're all men. We tend to think that we can only be what other people see us as potentially being. Because we've grown up in a culture that says white people are like this, black people are like this, women are like this, men are like this. And so children who grow up hearing that stuff tend to think of themselves as being categorized, fixed, having an identity. They come with an identity. We only have the potential for certain things, but there's always a ceiling, and you can't go beyond it, right? This is not what Pico thinks, obviously, but it's also not what standard humanists think. Um, uh, make sure you look and read the, um, um, there's some tenets of humanism that are listed out in the, my, um, the lecture notes I put up on uh, the Renaissance and humanism. So look at that, because as the word suggests, humanism is a focus on the abilities of humans. Hitherto, human beings thought that everything that we did or were or had the potential to be, if we had any potential at all, was all due to God that God decided everything, we didn't necessarily have the free will to make any real decisions for ourselves. Humanists, and humanism started with the ancient Greeks, said, you know what, this is a bunch of crap. This isn't the way that it is. Human beings are endowed with extraordinary capacities to control their own destinies. It's not all up to God or the gods. Okay, these are Greek thinkers, so they're gonna say the gods. We can do this. We are endowed with rationality. That's extraordinary. And that allows us to strive to become things that are more extraordinary than we ever thought we could be. And we are endowed with free will. We have the will to choose who we want to be. So, by the way, one of the consequences of this kind of attitude about humanity is that if you fail at life, as it were, if you find yourself in a place that other people suggest is failure, whose fault is that? You don't get to blame anybody anymore. I understand that um, there are many children who grow up in the world 
who get the short end of the stick for one reason or another. They grow up in a third world country. They grow up with parents or someone who abuses them or molests them. All kinds of terrible things happen to people. And that can certainly put a strain on our, our abilities to choose to overcome those things. But it never takes away our ability to choose to overcome. Those kinds of environments, those horrible environments that many, pe probably more people than not, grow up in on this planet, never fully take away the element of human choice. We are endowed innately with free will with the ability to choose, to strive, to overcome, but it is based on a choice. So anybody who says, well, I had this or that happen to me as a child, of course I was going to turn out bad. What do you expect? You know, I'm 50 years old. I couldn't have done otherwise. Yes, you could have. As an adult, you could have gotten yourself into some therapy. You could have done something. You chose not to, right? Now, of course, Pico is not, I mean, there are always exceptions. If somebody is just chained up in a basement their whole life, I don't know what they're supposed to choose to do. Um, but he's not talking about people like that. He's talking about standard people living a standard life, and standard human lives are tough, and they are full of suffering. But it is within our capacity to overcome all of that, never to succumb, to say, never to say, this is all I can do. I am not capable of anything more. We are always capable. We always have the choice. It doesn't mean that everybody has exactly the same capacity. It's something like IQ. You can, your IQ can fluctuate. I mean, you have, you're born with something like a range and like 15 points, something like that. And if you study, um, if you read books, if you do, you know, all kinds of um, different intellectual activities, you can raise your IQ. And 15 points is actually kind of a lot. I mean, that can really set you um, uh, at a different level in terms of, intelligence, whatever kind of intelligence IQ really does measure. Um, let's just say something like academic intelligence, okay? It can certainly set you at a different level, but it is your choice to challenge yourself. It is your choice to read Frankenstein, the book itself, or to read the cliff notes, right? If you choose not to challenge yourself, then it's only your fault that you remain academically limited. And it doesn't mean, there are some people who are born, you know, their, their IQ range is 1 to 115. Um, and then there are people who are born with, you know, an extraordinary range, 180 to 195, which is unbelievable, right? So if you have the, you know, 1 to 115 range rather than this insane genius range, Sure, that's something you can't choose, but you can work within that. And even people with, um, who are born with um, a, a, a paralysis, who can't walk, and are in wheelchairs from, you know, the, when they're born. Um, well, when they can walk, I guess. Um, even those people can create for themselves the most successful lives possible. Here's why. This is an important aspect of what Pico is doing. Um, actually, let me, let me pause on that one. Let me look at the, um, the next thing I've written here. So, this first sentence, I say, um, so man was created with the ability, the free will, to choose who he wants to be. And he can choose to be either beastly or divine. Okay? Um, and the idea here is if you choose to be beastly, that means that you allow yourself um, 
to behave poorly. You are not a virtuous person. You're not a rational person. You respond to your life with emotion. You yell and scream at people you love instead of remaining calm and compassionate. Instead of saying, you know what? We can find a solution to this problem. And since we love each other, let's try to do that. But first, let's be calm and patient. Let's keep in the forefront of our minds that we care about one another that we want our relationship to continue and to be enriched. So let's find a rational solution. And that might mean that I have to go home for an hour and cool down and then call you afterward. But I'm going to choose to be a higher kind of person, a better kind of person, a more human kind of person. Because animals don't come with the same ability for rationality and patience and so forth that human beings do. They don't get to choose to just say, you know what, I'm not going to kill this deer and eat it. I'm going to be compassionate today. It probably has its own family. I don't want to take it away from its family. It, okay, nope, the animals don't do that, right? They don't have that capacity. We, on the other hand, are a little bit different. We can say, my desire to yell at you, to yell at this person I love so much, my desire to get back at you, my desire to win the argument is not as important, it is not as virtuous as my overarching desire, which is to have loving, intimate relationships, romantic or otherwise, with other human beings and other creatures on this planet. That is the thing that makes me truly happy. More than winning an argument, and certainly more than hurting someone I love because I lost my temper. I have the capacity to calm down and look through my priorities and try to understand better what it means to be virtuous. And I happen to think, and a lot of a lot of people and thinkers throughout history think that it has something to do with compassion, um, which can be a tough nut to crack, right? It's hard to be compassionate, especially when you're angry, especially when someone hurt you. It's hard to forgive. But um, one thing we have the capacity to do as human beings is to be virtuous and to be rational. But what that means is that when, <clears throat> when someone I love has hurt me, here's what is neither compassionate nor rational, um, given that this person probably also loves me. What is neither compassionate nor rational is to think that um, the person was just being malicious. Generally, when we love people and we do things um, that are hurtful to them, and we do that all the time, sadly, uh, we're not doing it solely to be malicious. The intent isn't some sort of like sociopathic malice. That's, that's not really how we operate. When we are not sociopaths, right? When we're not, What's usually going on underneath is that we are hurting, we are suffering, and we're lashing out. You know, I had a crummy day, so I was snippy or grouchy in the morning, and, you know, or I was in pain because of, I just broke my leg, so I yelled at my mom when she came to visit me in the hospital, something like that, right? It's not because I actually want my mother to hurt because I hate her, something like that. We just lash out when we are hurting, right? I mean, in, the, in that regard, we are animals, and we are animals. But when someone that you love and, and who loves you does that, 
what we have the capacity to do is to curb our initial gut emotional responses, which are to lash back or to cry, to try to make the other person feel guilty for what they've done, things like that. We have the capacity instead to say, I know that you're having a bad day. I know that you're coming from a place of suffering. I know you've been having a bad year. Or, I don't know why you're in this mood. I don't know why you're treating me like this. But I have real faith that you love me. So I know you must be treating me like this because there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. But maybe we could talk about that. But I'm not going to get angry with you. And I might have to leave for a minute and let you cool down. But I'm not going to put more non-virtuous anger and malice into this relationship. Because it's not right. And because it's not rational. And those kinds of choices any of us can make at any time. And when we don't make those choices to be better, to exhibit true humanity, especially in the moments when it's difficult, that is when we lose our humanity, when we're not human at all. We become beasts, brutes, animals. Um, and so Pico thinks that it's up to us throughout our lives to choose to be better. And we all have the opportunity to choose to be more virtuous, more compassionate, even if I don't have the opportunity to choose to have 190 IQ, which is okay, because I can be the most extraordinary human being no matter what IQ I have. Being an extraordinary human being, certainly for a thinker like Pico, has something to do with one's intelligence, one's concern for the humanities, all right, make sure you read that stuff. But even more than that, it's a concern for one's dignity and for the dignity of others, for one's virtue. And even a child can cultivate his own virtue. Right? Um, now, I put up this quote. It's... Man, um, so thou mayest sculpt thyself into whatever shape thou dost prefer. Right? You can sculpt yourself into whatever shape you want because we don't come with a form, a shape, an identity. We come, uh, the image is almost, um, we come into the world as pure potential. <laughs> My dog is being cute. Um, to be anything. But it's up to us to learn what those best things are that we can become and to choose to become them. That line is, um, if you look on page three, the first paragraph, left hand column on page three, um, from a go down uh, five lines from the bottom of that first paragraph. And that's where he says, Thou mayest sculpt thyself into whatever shape thou dost prefer. Thou canst grow downward into the lower natures, which are brutes. Um, I just lost my thought. Thou canst grow again upward from thy soul's reason into the higher natures, which are divine. So, we have the opportunity either to choose, choose to be brutish by hmm, not being human, not cultivating, cultivating our virtue, or we can choose to be so amazing 
that we completely transcend our humanness. I don't mean humanity, because humanity means something like virtue. I mean humanness, that we have a, a human body. And he even says in here that we are neither, oh, and I actually I put it right up there, that we are neither mortal nor immortal. That seems crazy. I mean, aren't we just mortal? We are biological organisms. You know, we've always heard the gods are immortal. We're immortal. Nope. That's not what he thinks. And there's a reason why. Um, the soul, uh, of course, the body, Pico maintains, is mortal. Yes, the body dies. Fine. The soul does not have to because... Um, it can become a word you might have uh, heard before, enlightened. And enlightenment, in this sense, means that we can come to be unified with God. Now I'll say more about that in a second, but first look at my notes. Um, I, uh, I put just the phrase, the plant image. If you look at the second paragraph, oh, that's a huge paragraph too. Um, look at the second paragraph on page three. And, okay, um, go down, see where, um, if you go down like five lines, it says Lucilius, and then there's the little footnote number three right after it. Okay, go down four more lines. At man's birth, the father placed in him every sort of seed and sprouts of every kind of life. The seeds that each man cultivates will grow and bear their fruit in him. If he cultivates ve vegetable seeds, he will become a plant. If the seeds of sensation, he will grow into brute. If rational, he will become a heavenly animal, etc., etc. Um, here's the big idea. And if he is not contented with the lot of any creature, if he is not contented to be any creature on this earth, a brute, a plant, whatever, but takes himself up into the center of his own unity, hmm, then made one spirit with God and settled in the solitary darkness of the Father, who is above all things, he will stand ahead of all things. What he's saying here is um, pretty standard um, mysticism. Mysticism is an, um, how do I say this? An understanding of religion uh, that's very old. It's much older than Pico. Thousands and thousands of years older. Uh, every religion is either mystical in its very nature. Um, so religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism, and uh, Native American religions tend to already have mostly mystical elements in them. Um, and the Western, the, the great monotheistic Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all have mystical sects, right? They have uh, groups or particular important thinkers throughout their history um, that are mystical. Mysticism is uh, the, the general idea that the, the purpose of religion, the sort of goal of religion is for the believer to experience a direct unity, a oneness, um, a relationship of pure identity with God um, or with the divine. Okay, so um, Christianity has uh, plenty of mystics. Uh, if you think this is weird and you're anybody who's watching this since you're in the United States, if you're any religion at all, you're probably a Christian. Um, Christianity in and of itself uh, already has many mystical elements. It's a, it's a beautiful religion. Um, Judaism 
it's very mystical, uh, and Islam has uh, one of the most beautiful mystical groups I have ever seen um, of any religion. So, um, Pico was uh, very influenced by mysticism, and the editors actually, they mention it in the, um, read, the, the section reading the selections at the top of page two. Um, they mention in here that Pico was a student much later, a thousand years later, of uh, Plato's works. And um, the important interpretation of Plato that Pico read and used here is called Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism is understood as the mystical interpretation of Plato. Um, and it is the interpretation of Plato to which I ascribe, certainly. So, um, for Plato, human beings have the ability to choose what they love in life, what they desire, what they want to achieve, right? Love is desire. It is a wanting something, okay? And it's always something that I lack. Otherwise, if I already have it, like, I want this book. Let me have this book right now. I want it. That's ridiculous because I already have it. It's mine. I own it. It's my book. I don't want it because I already have it. Right? We desire that which we do not have. Okay? Um, there's more to this discussion, and if you want to hear more, then you should take my um, Philosophy 101 class because we read this. And take it face-to-face because -face online, this sucks. I can't ask you any questions. That's terrible. So, just take it face to face. It's, it's much better. Um, but Plato says that most people stop. There's a there's a hierarchy of of loves of that which you can desire in life, right? At any given moment, I might desire some water or something. He's not talking about that. He's talking about like. The, we desire certain things as like our end goal and a lot of people does desire money and that <laughs> is stupid because it's not going to make you happy and you can have all the money in the world and you would give it all up to have someone who loves you or to have someone who has loved you back again no no nobody oops, sorry. nobody takes that stuff seriously um, so, most people, he says, stop at desiring or loving one other person. We want to, you know, this is romantic love, right? We want to fall in love and have a baby, okay? Uh, most people stop there, and that's the lowest form of love for Plato. And it goes all the way up, all these different things. And the highest form of love, you might imagine, is truth. In other words, God, the highest form of love, of that which we can search for in our lives, is to know the truth of the universe, right? To know God. Love is that which allows us to achieve wisdom virtue, and happiness. But it is a choice to love things that are more important, right? Which is why when human beings, Buddhist, Christian, it doesn't matter, give up this life and join a monastery, and they say, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have children. I'm taking vows of chastity, vows of poverty. Because the most important thing is enlightenment, is the love of God. Okay, Buddhists don't believe in a God, but they believe in enlightenment. Okay, um, Some understanding of a real truth. That is what I'm searching for. That's what I desire for my life. And that's the only thing that matters. All of this other stuff is secondary. 
Jesus, if you are a Christian, I, I certainly hope you know this. Jesus, read your Bible. Jesus said, if you truly want to follow me, you have to leave behind your family and your older relatives. This life tends to pull us away from the search for the most important thing ever. We get distracted, we get bogged down, and it keeps us in a place of suffering a lot of the time. But a relationship, a, a the kind of relationship with God that these guys are talking about is one that consumes you. Like I said, it's one of identity. That means the believer and God are one and the same. There is no difference anymore. It's such a complete transcendence of this world that I and I and God are one. And that is what gives me immortality. Now, don't get all fussy and um, start thinking that this is blasphemous. Um, uh, throughout history, Islam and Christianity have often thought that mystical thinkers, um, uh, that Orthodox Christians and Muslims have often thought that mystical thinkers were blasphemous. And the funny thing is that the mystical thinkers are the ones who exude the greatest compassion. And for Christians who have been the most like Jesus, The Orthodox Christians, I mean, the Catholic Church, and we'll see this, the Catholic Church uh, in its history is full of the most atrocious cruelties. Some of the greatest crimes against humanity that have ever been perpetrated were done by the Catholic Church. The mystics never did anything like that. So, hmm. now, here is a particular mystic, and she was a Christian, um, St. Teresa. So I have the picture here in the Word document, so I assume you should be able to see it. Um, so it's called, this is a sculpture. Uh, uh, well, yeah, um, it's called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa, and um, the artist's name is Bernini. It's in Rome, and it's in a, uh, the um, Corona, no, that's not right, Car I, I forget the name of the cathedral right now. It's in a cathedral in Rome, and it was done um, in the 17th century. Let's take a look. This is important. The this ecstasy of St. Teresa, um, the mystical experience is characterized by feelings of complete ecstasy or euphoria or bliss. Um, the Hindus um, say that the one of the three things that characterizes the um, enlightenment, which is the uh, oneness with Brahman, the divine, okay? Um, it's not like a Christian god, but it's their understanding of the divine. It's called Brahman. Um, one of the things that characterizes the um, uh, oneness with Brahman, which is for them enlightenment, uh, is bliss. So this is a pretty, and Hinduism is really old. <laughs> this is a, a pretty ancient idea, okay? Now look at her. So, first of all, um, this is, I'm sorry, I can't point at it. You can't see me pointing, but, well, whatever. Um, so, notice her face. 
Her eyes are closed, the mouth slightly open, head back. Um, interesting expression. Look at the angel. If you look in his uh, right hand, he's holding an arrow. Okay, so love. Cupid, right? The Cupid shooting the arrow into the person's heart to make them fall in love. Okay, first of all, this ecstasy of Saint Teresa. The ecstasy is at um, the the mystical experience that's occurring. She is right now. I mean, this is an illustration of the moment when she became one with God. Um, and you can read her writings. She's such a beautiful woman. Uh, very, very important in Christianity. But sometimes people thought that she was subversive because they didn't like this idea that a human being could become one with God. But um, mystics understand love as the greatest choice we can ever make to love God which is the only thing that will allow us to become one with God and to know true happiness, ecstasy. So notice the arrow that he's holding, Cupid's arrow, love. Trace it on the picture or hold something, hold a ruler up or something. It is not angled at her heart. See where it is angled. It's a little bit lower than her heart. Okay? A little bit lower than her stomach. And then look back at her facial expression. Look at the folds of her robe. I guess it's a robe. I mean, she's just sitting there. Why would it be all like... I mean, I'm just sitting here. Do the fold, I mean, I have, there's folds on my dress. It doesn't, they don't look sort of frenzied like this. This isn't contentment, serenity. It's not the serenity of St. Teresa. It's the ecstasy to be filled, literally and figuratively, with God. <laughs> is a moment of pure passion and frenzy. Um, and you notice the, the arrow is a phallic symbol. Okay, I hope you know what that is, but um, it's a symbol of the penis. But there's more to a phallus than just a penis. It's a symbol of manhood, masculinity, power. Okay, so when a woman in sexuality... When a woman takes a man inside of her, literally, she takes him inside of her figuratively too, spiritually, emotionally, right? This is an image. It's a very erotic image. It's sexual. I mean, the, her face is climactic. She's taking God into her. And, of course, that is, it's figurative here, um, but the image, the phallic symbol, and so on, illustrates that she is taking, she's taking a, a masculine power inside of her and being filled by it. And in, I think deep spiritual sexual intimacy, we do feel a oneness with the other person. We should, I hope. And that's exactly what's happening here. She is experiencing the oneness with God. And you see the, the rays um, in the background, these long yellow things. I mean, there's a rays of sun. And God, the, excuse me, the sun has been used as the image of God forever. Plato used it as the image of God. Okay. Um, so we have this potential to overcome 
this body, this world, so perfectly that we don't just become like God. We become part of God. We become one. But that is a choice. It's a choice to love. And it's a choice to love truth. By the way, make sure you understand, it. Um, certainly Pico is speaking at a time when people are just theists. I mean, he's speaking in a Christian world, so he's talking about God. Plato uh, wrote 500 years before Jesus ever lived. He's not, when Plato talks about these same ideas and Pico is taking them in large part from Plato as well as a number of other religions. Um, Plato wasn't talking about a Christian god. That's ridiculous. There, there wasn't an idea like that when Plato was writing. He's talking, of, he doesn't, he uses a different term, but he's talking about truth, right? The truth of the universe. Well, if God is anything other than, like, if you don't discover the truth of the universe, at the moment of your enlightenment, in other words, at the moment of knowing God, then I'm not really sure what else you could possibly, like what else there is to get from knowing God. Obviously, the, knowing God, feeling God, experiencing God is going to provide you with this kind of knowledge of the universe. And that's how Plato talks about it as truth with a capital T. So don't be turned off if you're not religious or anything by this idea as if you couldn't possibly feel this or understand this because you don't believe in God or something. First of all, the, the people who talked about this first didn't talk about it in terms of a Christian God or any kind of monotheistic God at all. They talked about it in terms of everything, the universe itself, nature, whatever you want to say. And the oldest people who've talked about these kinds of things um, are, well, the, the Hebrews, who are originally polytheistic, by the way, um, and are much older than Christ, much, 5,000 years, much older than Christianity and even older than, than Islam. Um, and, um, so, very old people there, and the Hindus, uh, the Hindu, the Hindus are very old, so, and then, um, more tribal, nature-based, indigenous kinds of religions, um, and that's what has always been around. So, these kinds of people were speaking about the unity with whatever in a very different way. It's a unity with something like nature if you just want to go with that. So it's always possible for anybody, no matter their religious preference, even if there's no religious preference, that you can understand this idea because there's no way to deny the existence, by the way, of nature. I don't know what else the changing of the seasons is but nature. So don't bother denying that one. And people have felt that given that we are a part of, obviously a part of nature, since we are biological organisms, natural organisms, that we have a important connection to nature. Okay? So don't think that this is beyond you in any way. Okay? All human beings have the capacity to understand these kinds of ideas. Okay, um, now, oh, so I wrote down a few more things. Um, he makes this nice point. This is, um, okay, so I, I right after the picture that's in there, I wrote, our form does not limit what we can become. And then I put the begin. it's a long portion of the text, um, the beginning of this quote, if you see a man given over to his belly. Um, where is this here? Oh, so it, go to the top of the right-hand column on page three. 
um, go one sentence in. And his saying so was reasonable, for it's not the rind which makes the plant, but a dull and non-sentient nature which makes the plant. It's not the rind. It's not this the outside. So, like, imagine a watermelon. It's not the green part on the outside that makes it a watermelon. It's the inside, okay? Uh, not the hide which makes a, makes a beast of burden, but a brutal and sensual soul. It's not the spherical body which makes the heavens, but it's right reason which makes the heavens. And it's not a separateness from the body, but a spiritual intelligence which makes an angel. So if you look at all of these um, things that he's listing here, I mean, he's, he's suggesting it's not the outside form. It's not what you see that makes a thing what it is. It's as it were. It's what's inside. It's what you can't see. So when you look at me, you see a body. I mean, there's I have flesh and things. You see a woman. You see a white woman. You see a young woman. I don't know, you know, there are probably a hundred other things that you see when you look at me. I have a pretty big nose. I know that, right? Who knows what else you see? Um, you see all kinds of things that you associate with the fact that I'm a young woman and I'm a professor, right? So you think, and I know that people think this until I start talking, um, what the hell? Who is this kid? What is she? I'm actually, I'm, I'm older than I look, by the way. But um, you think, who is this kid? What does she know? No, well, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> this is, uh, the, I've been teaching this for a, a while. Um, but we see all kinds of things in people and animals, right? We see them. And we say, well, you have this color skin, or you have whatever, therefore, you are inferior, or you're superior, or whatever. Okay, we see all kinds of things. But as he's saying, it's not what you see that makes the thing what it is. It's something else, something that you can't see with your eyes. Um, let's look at the next bit. For example, if you see a man given over to his belly and crawling upon the ground, it is a bush and not a man that you see. When someone acts like that, they are choosing not to act out of their humanity, their humanness. They're choosing to act like something that isn't human. And that's not meritorious, as Pico sees it. What we need to choose is humanity and beyond to transcend it, to become one with God through love. Um, if you see anyone blinded by the illusions of his empty and calypso-like imagination, seized by the desire of scratching and delivered over to the senses, it is a brute and not a man that you see. So if you see somebody, um, Calypso, he's got a little note down here at the bottom. Um, if you've read the Odyssey, um, Odysseus, so he's coming back from the Trojan War, he's trying to get back to his wife, Penelope, in the Odyssey. And the, the Odyssey is the story of him after the war, trying to get home to his wife. And um, Calypso is a, a beautiful goddess who keeps him on her island. And, uh, you know, they have... She keeps him there with sex, basically. And she doesn't let him go for seven years? Yeah, seven years. <clears throat> so, I, I like how, by the way, that he, Pico acts, acts like Calypso is the one who is animalistic here and not uh, Odysseus at all for staying on an island 
for seven years having sex with a goddess instead of going home to his, his wife. Yeah, that's the most virtuous thing of all time. But that's part of his point. So when we act like that, when we allow our bodies to make our decisions for us, especially when hmm, our bodies want something that is irrational or dangerous or harmful, we're acting like animals because we have the capacity to say, number one, this is irrational, and number two, it's not virtuous, it's not right to do this thing, okay? And if you stuff McDonald's into your face every day, there's certainly an aspect of virtue in that. Um, we have an obligation to treat our bodies, ourselves, with kindness, just as we do to others. And treating your body like that does not seem to illustrate kindness to your body. So, um... But if we just give in to bodily desires for McDonald's all the time, first of all, that's your choice. And so if you get unhealthy and you gain a lot of weight, you gonna blame McDonald's? Pico says, ultimately it was your choice and you did not choose to be virtuous or rational and you got in trouble for it. You chose to be an animal. And you didn't have to. Um, go down to the last, which, oh, well. Okay, the next sentence. If you come upon a philosopher winnowing out all things by right reason, he's a heavenly and not an earthly animal. Uh, okay, if you come upon a pure con contemplator, ignorant of the body, banished to the innermost places of the mind, he is not an earthly and not a heavenly animal. He more superbly is a divinity clothed with human flesh. So somebody who transcends this world so much, I always think of the Buddha when I think, when I, I see this image, who's transcended it so much, he's not even, I mean, he's not even a man anymore. He just, he has a body, but he's so transcendent. He's so beyond this world that he is divine. Okay. Um, so down, oh, the next paragraph. Who is there that does not wonder at man? Who doesn't wonder about man, what we are, what we're supposed to be? Um, and it's not unreasonable that in the Mosaic and Christian Holy Writ, man is sometimes denoted by the name all flesh or every creature. The suggestion here is that uh, you may call me human, but what it means to be human is to not be anything in particular. It is to be the potential for all things, human or divine, or lower, a plant, right? Um, so if I, you know, if I choose to act in these inferior ways, I'm like a plant in a human body, or I'm an animal in a human body, or I'm divine in a human body. But that choice is mine. Um, let's see. Oh, here. I'll just stop. Oh, um, down the last paragraph of page three. Um, I'm just gonna start reading in the middle. It's it's pretty much right in the middle. Let a certain holy ambition. An ambitious person strives for greatness, invade the mind, so that we may not be content with mean things. That word, this is an antiquated usage of the word mean. It doesn't mean um, something like, I'm being mean to you. You hurt my feelings. You were mean to me. That's not the idea. Um, it means lower, inferior, lowly things. Okay? Um, but may aspire to the highest things and strive with all our forces to attain them. 
For if we will to, if we want to, if we try, we can. If we have the ambition, if we have the will, willpower, we always say, if we strive, we can attain divinity itself. Right? Remember, no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to be able to, I, I don't know, uh, something stupid, um, be 10 feet tall, like actually 10 feet tall. I can't will that. I can't will myself to grow. I'm 5'5". Five five. That's, I'm 32 years old. I, I don't think I'm going to grow anymore. I'm done with that. I can't will a growth spurt that's absurd. And that's not what he's talking about. It's also not what he cares about. Because it doesn't matter if you're 10 feet tall, if you're 4 feet tall, if you're fat, if you're ugly, if you're beautiful, if you're rich, if you're poor. Those kinds of things that we think matter, they don't matter. They are stupid. They are pointless. What matters... is how human you are. And the greatest humans are those who are filled with love for everything, not just God, and who strive to know. Typical Renaissance thinking. Okay. <laughs> now, the last thing. Um, so, if you look on page four, the left-hand column, the very bottom of it, uh, actually, we'll go up maybe ten lines from the bottom. Um, okay. Who does not wish to have breathed into him the Socratic frenzies? Notice that frenzy, ecstasy sung by Plato in the Phaedrus, this is a platonic dialogue, doesn't matter, that by the oar-like movement of wings and feet he may quickly escape from here, that is, from this world where he is laid down as in an evil place, and be carried in speediest flight to the heavenly Jerusalem. We shall be possessed um, by these Socratic frenzies, which will so place us outside of our minds that they will place our mind and ourselves in God. The image here that um, he's using from Plato's dialogue is, um, uh, Plato says that love <laughs> gives us wings. Um, it allows, love allows us to fly to ever higher and greater heights. And what he means there is to fly to the heights of truth, to come to know truth. And um, so, Pico is um, using that image here and saying, who doesn't wish that they were so in love with truth that they became extraordinary because of it? Who would wish to just follow their body's desires around? Cause I think we all know how much suffering that brings us. But to follow virtue and reason, that is the only thing that brings true happiness, true bliss, and truth. So, now, I hope you can do your discussion one, which is due on Sunday. Okay? So I'll put up um, the next lecture whenever, later this week, uh, assuming this one works and I don't have to do it again. All right? Bye, guys.